stress, fear, depression, spiritual warfare. Are you weighted down? Do you need refreshing? Welcome. Welcome everyone to the Warriors for Christ podcast, where we seek to uplift, edify, and encourage you to be light and salt in a dark and tasteless world with your host, Kyle. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Warriors for Christ podcast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Sam. And we are so delighted that you folks are going to spend some time with us today. Brother Sam, what does the Lord put on your heart for us to get into in this episode? Well, Kyle, today we're doing the the fifth and final episode on overcoming sin. Uh, We're actually going to look at the war in the flesh explained. And we're going to explain it. Kyle, I am really excited uh, because there are so many people, I used to be one of them, that identified and clung and held as a foundational verse that that epitomized the faith that I held um, with the passage in Romans chapter 7, verse 13 to 25, the struggling man, the man that cannot overcome, who continues to do the things that he doesn't want to do. And what a lot of people don't realize is, is through Romans, Paul goes in and does teaching. He's, he's teaching the different states of the old man and the new man, and he comes to this. But a lot of people just jump right in, and they don't know any of the befores or the afters or the uses of the words to realize that what is being taught, Kyle, by the pulpits in these different places, they're lying. Kyle, they are lying, distorting, and blaspheming the Word of God. And today, we're going to go through, and I'm going to let God's Word tear down and expose who the liar is. Amen. All right. Well, with that, I'll open us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you, O Lord God. We're so thankful for everything you've done for us in our life, O Lord. We thank you for our jobs. We thank you for our family, the ones that we love. We praise you, O Lord, for creating the heavens and the earth. We praise you and thank you for the gift of your spirit. We praise you and thank you for your holy word, that through it we might understand and have life. Father, we pray for each and every listener today, everyone that's listening right now, Lord, Take away all distractions from them. Allow them to hear the message that's being taught today. And Father, we pray you bless it and that you use it to work and build in the kingdom. And Father, we pray for the hearts of those that are listening. Father, open their hearts and their minds. Allow them to understand the truth and the power of your word and your spirit. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, Kyle, for those who might be listening to this episode jumping in here and haven't listened to the other ones. Um, We're going to cover a lot of the other ones, but I would encourage for people who are joining, if you haven't listened like the part two, what does it mean to be spiritually baptized or crucified? That's going to be key. We'll cover some of those passages here because, you know, it's God repeats them, and I want to make sure everyone has a proper definition. Uh, Same thing with what does it mean to be free? We'll cover some of the verses again, but that theme is going to come up. If you don't understand what the Bible says about being spiritually baptized and crucified, if you don't understand what the Bible says about being spiritually free, if you don't understand what the Bible says of distinguishing between what it means between flesh and spirit, these are all things that we covered before this to lay the background. Um, so if you, if people listening haven't heard of those other episodes, you know, the part two, the 3A, the 3B, and the part four... Um, it may be a little bit quick for you. Uh, we'll still cover it, and, and God's Word's going to stand on its own, but I would encourage you to, at a minimum, at least go back and listen to those other ones as well. Amen. So, starting off, up to this point, Paul has covered several series of rhetorical questions. Um, this is just one of another one. Uh, I normally look at the group of rhetorical questions starting in chapter 6 on. There's other ones as you go back even to the beginning of Romans. There's a lot of these that he, Paul uses to teach. He starts off and will pretty much make a statement of what is not true. Then he says, may it never be. Of course, God forbid, it's, it's not true. Then he says, what is true? And then he teaches and explains why it is true. So to start off, Kyle, let's just read through once through, um, here, this passage, verse 13 to 25, and, and I'll comment a little bit as we go. Maybe, maybe we'll go one or two, two, like, let's say two verses at a time. Um, I'll, I'll just comment to point things out as we go through, and then we're going to go back and we're going to more carefully examine each word 
using God's basis and other scripture that's already defined the use of these words. Okay, sounds good. <clears throat> Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be, rather it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment sin would become utterly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. Okay, so these first two verses, we already have the, the, the rhetorical question. Did you catch the rhetorical question? Yes, right there. And therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? So, so the question that's being asked is, is that which is good cause my death? Now, the law, what, referring to the law. The law. In verse 12, he says, the law is holy, the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. So he's talking about the law and the commandment. Yep. And he's like, no, of course not. That's not the cause of his death. So he asks, is the law the cause of the death? No. May it never be. It's and then sin. he says, what is? Rather, it was sin. It was sin. It was sin. Correct. So now we're going to go through, and he's going to explain, and, and again, not only the sin, but he says the commandment came so that sin would be shown to be what it is, sin. Now, he then repeats again what is true in verse 14, that what is spiritual or what is good? For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold into bondage to sin. Now, notice he doesn't say that he's spiritual, which is surprising, because we just talked about who the spiritual man is, but he doesn't identify with this spiritual man. No, he identifies with the flesh. Um, he actually says that the law is spiritual. Well, the law is spiritual, but the, the things of the Spirit and the gift of God surpasses that. And, you know, as I say that, Kyle, I just got convicted to go to a passage... I think it's in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And it talks about Moses when he had to put a veil on his face. Yeah, and and okay. this, this is to point this out, right? Because we're saying the law is good, but yet the law, there's something that surpasses it. Um, what is he, so what does he say in um, chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, reading verse 10? Actually, verse 8 through, um, actually, 7, 7 through 10. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to, e to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. So they're comparing the glory of the law versus the glory of the Spirit. And, and when you compare anything to the Spirit, even the law is considered a, a ministry of death because the law can't change a person. Now, the law is good. It shows what's holy. It points out and exposes sin, sins exactly. what's bad. Yep. But with respect to being able to save a person, the law cannot save. It's powerless. So even though it has glory, it has no glory when compared to the Spirit. Amen. So I look at this back when it says, we know know that the law is spiritual, now you can understand how much more the Spirit is spiritual, how much more the Spirit is glory. But notice, he's not even talking about that because he's comparing himself to the law because he can't compare himself to the Spirit because this person doesn't have the Spirit. Now, people might say, oh, that's your conjecture. Well, okay, we'll, we'll get there, but think about what we just read. Right. Okay, you're going to say that the law is spiritual when we know that compared to the Spirit, the law is a ministry of death. It, 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 compared to the Spirit, the law doesn't even have any glory, even though it says it came with glory, to the point that Moses' face shone. So, but notice he says, I'm a flesh. He doesn't identify with the Spirit. As a matter of fact, he identifies with being a, in bondage under something. To yeah, what? Sold into bondage to sin. That's right. Uh, read the next two verses, please. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Okay. Now, typically when someone becomes a Christian, they have the Spirit of God in them. Kyle, typically they're going to be doing evil or good. They're going to be doing good. You can only bear good fruit. That's right. But this person says they don't even understand. Uh, they don't do good. They only do the thing that they hate. Well, if they don't understand, and then we also know from Scripture that that's from a lack of understanding or knowledge that... That uh, people, people perish. perish. That's what God says. My people perish for lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. So, uh, but again, Kyle, what was the point we're trying to prove with the rhetorical question that 
what's the cause of the person's death? Cause of death is sin. The cause of death is sin. So in verse 16 again, who does he say? Um, or he says he continues to do the thing that he hates. If I do the thing I don't want to do in verse 16, I agree with the law. Again, agreeing that the law is good. Because remember, yep. the, the point is the law is not bad. The law is not the cause of your death. It's sin. Right. So in verse 17, what does he say then is doing this bad? So no, now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Oh, sin is dwelling in this person. Sin you mean dwells it? in there. It doesn't sound like it's the spirit dwelling. Uh, now, that's another interesting point. It doesn't talk about the spirit dwelling in him. Um, just the sin. That that means the sin must still be alive. Do you remember the rhetorical question of when you go back to Romans chapter 6, and we'll cover it later, but again, sin was supposed to be put to death. It That's was supposed right. to be crucified. It was supposed to be removed. But we're going to look more at the passages that talk about what's supposed to be dwelling in us. Is sin supposed to continue to dwell in us? No, it's not. Is the Spirit supposed to be dwelling? Yeah, amen. Yes. But here he says sin. And he's, this is, again, I think his rhetorical person the the he's using the first person as a as an example correct yes now if you look back not at necessarily verse... referring to the apostle himself not having the spirit in him well un- unless he's going back in time referring to himself when he was at this point but look at verse 18 and 19 he kind of repeats the struggle again for i know that nothing good dwells in me nothing good is in him that is in my flesh for the willing is present in me but the doing of the good is not he's not able to do good For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. So we basically repeat it twice. He continues to do evil. He does not do good. Kyle, this is not a good prognosis for this person. That's right. He's not bearing good fruit. And so again, he proves that what is dwelling in him again in verse 20? But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. That's right. And he just repeats it. In verse 21, he says, I find this law. So now he says there's a law. When I desire to do good, evil is present with me. That's the law he says he finds in his body. When I desire to do good, evil is present in me. Mm. And not only that, but he desires to do good, but he can't do good. He continues to do evil. He says this is a law. The word is law. The law, this law, is what is in him. So, again, he repeats that he agrees with the law of God in the inner man. Remember, the law is good. It's not bad. But, again, there's a problem. What law is at work in his body in verse 23? But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. So now he says this law that's working in him has made him a prisoner. Yep. Kyle, does that mean he's free or he's in chains? He's in chains. You mean the yoke and the bonds that's and the right. chains he haven't has, been released? He has the bondage. He has not been released or freed. But is, that's what he said in verse 14. So it's consistent. Yep. So he's not being double-minded here from the standpoint of contradicting himself. He's, right. he's being very consistent. But what we're going to find out later is... He is the double-minded man in the eyes of God, which will receive nothing from the Lord. Amen. Other than judgment and wrath and indignation. And we're going to look at this. He even proclaims what he truly is. So now he says what he truly is in verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? That's right. He's still a wretched man. And Kyle, when we continue to look later, we're going to find out that word is used only one other place in Scripture about the wretched man. Mm. And Kyle, it's not a good use. It's to one of the churches that was in trouble. Actually, it was written to one of the churches that God, as Jesus is speaking to them, basically says, you still do not have not have eyes to see. You still don't have clean clothes. You still are not rich. And so, again, implying that this person never even knew Christ. And, and we're going to find so much more of that, Kyle, when we start looking through God's Word. It's just really going to expose everything. And so not only is it wretched man, he still says, who will set me free from this body of death? Because he hasn't been freed. Now again, part two episode, being spiritually crucified and baptized. Um, part 3a, what does it mean to be free? This person's hasn't been free. And as we go through Scripture, it's all going to line up and be consistent with the words that Jesus spoke, the words that the apostles spoke. So then he says in verse 25, there's only one thing that can set him free. 
is, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he recaps the state that he's still stuck in, where with his mind, he's a slave to the law of God, but with his flesh, the slave to the law of sin. He's still a slave to the law of sin, consistent with what he started in the very beginning. It's kind of bookends. And then it goes into how do you escape the condemnation in chapter 8. Yeah. So, Kyle, that's the high-level summary. I just want to walk through that very briefly before we now dig in deep and start really digging into Scripture as let God defines what these things are. Yeah. Now, one of the things I, I wanted to to just retouch on was verse 25 there again. The very first exclamation there that he said, you know, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, uh, in my understanding, is the answering of the question, who will set me free from the body of this death? That's right. And that answers that question. Then the rest of the verse goes on to restate his current state of condemnation. Yeah. And then the next verse after that in chapter 8, verse 1, then tells you how you escape the condemnation. Exactly. But people don't put all these things together. Yeah. And and it's I think it's often mistaught. So I'm, I'm glad we were able to, to touch on that. It is. So going back to verse 13. The first thing in verse 13 is answering the question, what's the cause of the death? He says, rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by working out my death through that which is good. That's what sin does. Sin works out your death. Uh, the word is is katergazomai. Uh, katergazomai. Uh, uh, yeah. Katergazomai. Yes. Thank you, Kyle, for helping me out there. And the root of that word, ergazomai, um, is to work. Uh, so kata is to work out. Ergazomai is to work. It's basically, what are you working? So I, I thought it interesting to say, well, let's go look at how God uses this word um, in other places of scripture. Uh, does it give context of what are we supposed to be working out? Or what ergazomai work are we supposed to be doing? And what's the consequences of the work? And what does Jesus say? So, so, so for the people that are following along that have their Bibles, uh, if you have a Strong's Concordance, the word that we're looking at is G2716. It's Greek 2716. 2716, correct. Yep, 2716. So uh, first I said, well, let's look at the passages in Romans, right? This is the book that we're in. Let's see how it's used in other places of the book of Romans. So, well, Kyle, we don't, let's flip back to Romans chapter two. Okay. What does it mean to be working out? What would it be to be working out? Now, chapter two, it, it, it's, it's, there's other words that we're going to come back to. Um, but in chapter two, verse, let's see, it was verse nine. Um, read verse nine, and then we're going to back up and, and go through a, a couple more. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. So that does evil is the person that is still working evil. Yep. The person that's working evil the soul of that person is going to have tribulation and distress from God. Now, remember, the, the word, the root word of it is ergazomai, um, which is the work. Well, that's used several times above as you read down. So it first starts off in verse 6. It says, God, it, well, in verse 5, it talks about because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself and the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now, the person he's speaking to, is this a, the new man or the old man, Kyle? Be the old man. The old man, the man who still has the wrath of God. That's right. And it says, God will render each man according to his work. Um, his work. The the root is... Aragon. Aragon, yep. 2041. See, all these are associated. So, what is your work? Well, then he says, uh, as you keep reading... To those who by perseverance in working good, ergon, yeah. ergon, right, doing the good work, you're persevering in this work, seek for glory, honor, and immortality, you get eternal life. It's what are you working? If you're working good, you get eternal life. Now, we just read earlier in verse 9, but if evil, well, then you have tribulation and distress from God for your soul. Uh, but verse 8, those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what do they get? Wrath and indignation. That's right. Then he goes on, he says, and that he summarizes, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who is working out or working. 
Katergazomai. Evil. Yeah, yep. But glory and honor and peace, verse 10, to everyone who, Ergazomai, who is working what? Good. Good. So if you're still working evil, you're in trouble. But if you're working good, then you have glory and honor and peace from God. If you're working the perseverance of good and seeking glory, honor, and immortality, you get eternal life. So, Kyle, do you see how that's pretty clear? Yep. And now, lays... we want to we also just make sure that people understand. We're talking about that this is the spirit in the man that that causes righteous actions to come because it's the gift of God. That spirit works righteousness in our lives as a natural part of, of our rebirth, our regeneration. Correct. This is not uh, works not of the, the works law. Of man. It's not yep. works of man. It's works of the spirit. And, and we covered more of that earlier. I, I think when you go back and you listen to the other episodes that we did, Kyle, yeah, it's very I, I like clear. to remind folks on these things because sometimes you we'll have people that just won't listen to everything. And that is true. Want to make sure they don't jump to some kind of false conclusions about what we're what we're teaching here. Yeah. And Romans chapter five, right? In Romans chapter five, talking about the man that has uh, been made has become righteous by faith. Uh, they have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it talks about this person who has a hope. Yep. And in this hope, what is the result in verse 3? And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Now, that brings about perseverance is works perseverance. That's right. That, that same, that's right. That same word, works perseverance. Now, you're noticing that, Kyle, these words that were, the, these passages we're reading seem opposite of the man that we discussed. <laughs> In Romans chapter 7, that's correct. verse 13, because that one has sin working death in his life. Here it's like, well, no, it's you're to be working perseverance. You're to be working good. You're to, right. you know, if not, then you're going to have tribulation distress and the wrath of God. And so I'm just pointing out. Now, this person, again, in, in, in Romans chapter 5, who has been uh, declared righteous by faith, well, what do they have in their heart in verse 5? And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That's right. And we know earlier about, you know, what does it mean to be set free? That the Spirit is now to be dwelling in us. Amen. Uh, God causes that to dwell in us and in our heart, in our innermost most being. And we're going to look at that later. Well, how is that? How can we say we have nothing good in us if that's the case? Uh, how can we not be conquering if that's the case? Exactly. Well, unless you don't have the Spirit inside of you, um, that would make sense for the old man, which is, as we keep reading, we're going to find out that's the man that Romans chapter 7, verse 13 to 25 is talking about, the wretched man, the condemned man, the man that we don't want to be, Kyle, because there's no good thing for that man. Um, the, the word, that word is also used in other places, also in Romans chapter seven, um, in verse 15, when he says, for what I am doing, it's like what I am working out, he doesn't understand. In Romans chapter seven, verse 17, when he says, so then no longer am I the one working it out, but again, the sin that's living in him. And he repeats those again in verse 18 and in verse 20, right? Cause he repeats everything twice. Now, the next place, and uh, where uh, the other place we have this word also used, is in Romans chapter fifteen, about working out. Uh, what are we to be working out? Um, what does he say in Romans chapter fifteen, <clears throat> verse eighteen? Verse eighteen: For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. By word and deed. And of course, you know, word and deed or ergon, right? The, mm -hmm. Your work. Yeah. Um, and the resulting in is, what are you working out? Well, he says, listen, what Christ has accomplished in me is working out in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed or work. Uh, they're walking in obedience. And remember, right. do you obedience. remember why Paul was made uh, an apostle? To bring Romans about the obedience of righteousness. To bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. And then he goes on and talks about how it's the righteousness that's supposed to be in our lives. Yeah. And this righteous man is to be living by faith as we're producing the righteousness in our bodies. So again, you have this theme. It's even repeated at the end of Romans chapter 15. Verse 18. Um, and confirmed again by signs and wonders and the power of the Spirit in verse 19. Yep. Now, in 2 Corinthians, 
Katagazomai used again. What are we to be working out? Because again, this man in Romans chapter 15 only works, you know, sin is working out and producing death, and sin continues to work out, or what's in him, he continues to work out that which is evil, the things that he hates. In 2 Corinthians, it talks about um, the sorrow. Chapter. There's a difference between this, uh, chapter 7, this, there's a difference between the sorrow of God versus the sorrow of the world. You see, the sorrow of God produces something that the sorrow of the world cannot. What does the sorrow of God produce in verse 9 of chapter 7? I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. Now, see, that's the sorrow of God. It results in a true repentance. Amen. But you see, the sorrow of the world, you're going to feel remorse. You're going to be like, oh, gee, why am I doing this? I don't want to do this. But the problem is, Kyle, the sorrow of the world can only work death, kind of like this man in Romans chapter 13. Mm -hmm. Remember, he just continues to work death. Romans 7, 13. That's right, 7, 13, because he doesn't have the true sorrow of God. You see... For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the world works out death in you. Yeah. And that's, again, that word used again. Ke- and so, and, and notice in, in, in Romans chapter 7, it also says it also works death in them. Or, Kyle, are you seeing the themes here? There's the man. It, it's contrast mm-hmm. here, here in Corinthians. Yep. It's contrasting two men. Someone who's come under the will of God, someone who has the sorrow of the world. They still recognize, oh, gee, woe is me, but they can't do the will of God. Right, the they sorrow can't of God have the repentance, repentance of God. Exactly. James, in James chapter two, another use of the word. What are we working out in our lives? Look there. What verse? Uh, chapter one, James chapter one. Sorry, verse two and three. Now this one, I'm gonna, I'm going to read it because the the words there's so much variation depending on what Bible you use. So I'm going to I'm going to highlight that when I read through it. Okay. So he says, "Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various tests or temptations." It's the same word. Really, we're to be counting it joy when we encounter these tests. Well, yes, because in verse three it says, "Knowing that the proof or the tested faith." The proof of your faith is working out endurance. There's that word again, working out endurance. So, Kyle, the question is, one, do people count it joy when they encounter these trials and tests or temptations? And the reason why they're supposed to be counted joy is because it's a proof of our faith when we're working out endurance, we're overcoming. Uh, Kyle, does the man in Romans chapter 7, this old man who cannot seem to overcome— Is he having endurance? No, he's failing. No, he's failing. He wants to have endurance, but he's failing. He's working out death in his life. Mm -hmm. He's not producing the endurance. And what endurance are we talking about here in verse 4? And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Yep, and that's actually a... uh, uh, a present imperative, it should be, it should say, an endurance must be having. Endurance must be having. Remember, knowing that the testing of your, fu- your faith is working out endurance, and endurance must be having its perfect result. The endurance that you have must be having the perfect result so that you might be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. But if you do lack, he tells you what you need to do. You still need to ask of God because you're lacking. Kyle, this person in Romans chapter 17 is lacking. Kyle, they aren't producing the endurance. They aren't working endurance. So those were the verses I wanted to cover with that first word. And that person can't, really, because they're working out evil, that person we talked about. That's right. So do you see how it's pretty consistent, Kyle? Yes, amen. Okay. Um, now I wanted to look at the other... So so that's that's the katagorazomai. Uh, now other passages for those who are working, the root, ergazomai. Mm -hmm. Um, again, because this person only is working the evil, they aren't working the good. So Kyle, what happens to somebody who confesses Jesus as Lord, right? That's what it sounds like this person in Romans 17, I would say they confess Jesus as Lord. Um, it sounds like they want to do good, but Kyle, we're actually going to look at a man who confesses Jesus as Lord, does other works, 
the problem is Jesus says they still work or ergozomai, uh, lawlessness, and he's not going to have kind words. What does Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23 say? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And it's you who work lawlessness. Yep. Ergazomai. Ergazomai. And And that's the same thing that what this person is doing in Romans chapter 7, verse 13 to 25. That's all they're working. Mm-hmm. All they're working is evil. All they're working is the things they hate. They don't work any good. Jesus is going to say to those people who continue to work lawlessness, depart from me, I don't know you. Even though they say, but I confess you as Lord. Even though he says, but I did this, I did this, I did this. It doesn't matter. There's a problem. You're working the wrong thing. John, in John chapter 3, when Jesus, right, he's speaking to Nicodemus. Mm-hmm. Remember that one? Yep. And a lot of people know John 3.16, the conditional verse that you might not perish um, and you might be saved. I'm like, well, what good is that? How do you take it from might to will? But in this one, and we're going to come back to this one again because this is used several times, but he tells us, Kyle, in John chapter 3, verse 21, about who is doing the work in God. Now, it says rotten God, but it's actually work, the works in God, the ergozomai. What does he say about chapter 3, verse 21? But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So you see, the one who is practicing the truth, uh, they're the one that comes to the light, so that their deeds or work may be manifested as having been worked in God. These are the works of God. This is the one who practices the truth. This is what Jesus says is the person that comes to the light. Well, that's not this man in Romans chapter 7 because they aren't doing the work of God. As a matter of fact, they cannot do the work of God. They continue to do the work as their slave of sin, and the sin that continues to be manifested. They cannot do any good. In Romans chapter 13, back to Romans, uh, and again, that's the book that we're in, right? So later on in chapter 13, it tells you what it means to love God, and really more specifically, love your neighbor as yourself. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it's going to tell us something about love. Did you say 10, 13 or 13? Uh, I'm sorry, 13, 10. Thank you for correcting me. Chapter 13, verse 10. Okay. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And you see, he just said, uh, right, we're to love our neighbor and the one who loves his neighbor fulfills the law in verse 8, because you shall not commit adultery, don't commit murder, don't steal. If there's any other commandment, verse 9, it's summed up in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why? As Kyle just read, because love works no wrong. Ergozomai. Love works no wrong. None. It doesn't do it. It does no wrong. And actually, I think that word is actually not wrong. If you actually look up that word, I think if I remember correctly, it's love does no evil. Kakos. That's right. Evil. I think it's... um, Worthless, depraved, injurious, evil, noisome, wicked. Yes. And that the word, the strong concordance is 2556. It's the same word that's used in Romans chapter 7 of the person who only does evil. The person who only does evil, repeated several times. Mm. Well, this here says, love works no evil. But yet, the man in Romans chapter 7, chapter 7, it says all he does is work evil. He works evil. Why do we want to be that man? That man's condemned. He can't love. Love is the opposite. Love works no evil. This man only works evil. That's right. Kyle, we're going to keep going through, and you're going to see these key verses that we talked about. Love the greatest commandment, how we're to live. And yet, this man can't do any of it. That's right, because he They're doesn't have the love of they God. They know what they want to do, but they can't. You know how many people out there go to church and are slaves of sin? You know how many people out there think they love, think they do the works of God, and cannot, Kyle? They identify with that man of Romans chapter 7, rightfully so, because they're still the wretched, condemned man. That's right. And they're being lied to, Kyle. They're being lied to. Yep. In James chapter 1, verse 20, it says, The anger of man cannot work the righteousness of God. 
It cannot work. Same word, ergazomai. It cannot work the righteousness of God. Do you, are you familiar with that verse? We've covered it so many times. Maybe people who are listening, if this is new, you might not have heard it. And James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, what does it say, Kyle? 19 and 20, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And it does not work. Does he not cannot work, work the, righteousness the righteousness of God. God. Do you have the anger of man? Well, you cannot work the righteousness of God. Oh, but I only have it sometimes. I don't do it always. Uh, I'm sorry. The Bible then commands you in verse 21, put aside all filthiness, all that remains of wickedness, because that's how God sees your heart, an imperative command and humility, you're receive commanded to what? Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Because they have not yet received the word implanted. Do you see how all these verses and words that we're looking at, when we look at these words, goes back to the man that's condemned, the man who cannot love, the man who is condemned under judgment, the man who doesn't have eternal life. The man who cannot work the righteousness of God that still has to receive the word implanted because he has not yet. And he's also the man that cannot prove himself to be a doer of the word, not merely hearer. He's who commanded to himself. become a doer of the word That's because right. he's still a hearer who deceives himself. Amen. Kyle, we're going to see so much more of this as we keep looking through these words. We have just started. We haven't even gotten in deep yet. We're just scratching the surface. And I pray people are listening. And James chapter 2, verse 9, it says, if you show partiality, because people are like showing preference between the rich man and the poor man, he says, you're working sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Goes on to say that you commit one, you commit everything. God will hold you guilty of everything. Amen. Now, let's move on. Let's go back to Romans chapter 7. Let's look at the next verse, verse 14. Kyle, verse 14, can you read that again? Yes. For we know that the law is spiritual... But I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. So, one, why isn't Paul saying that he's spiritual? He's not identifying with the spiritual man because, again, he's teaching. That's he's right, talking about teach. the man that's condemned and why sin is the cause of a person's death for a man who's still under sin. Now, we already know from our episode that we did in part two, the one who's been spiritually crucified and baptized, that this person is not to be a slave of sin. No, they are to be freed from sin. Uh, first, let's go back and highlight in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, I think it's like verse 30, 32. Jesus talks about, actually, I think it's verse 34. Let's get there, though. Um, yes. Verse 34. What does Jesus say? They didn't understand about what it means to be, what it means to be free. And again, he's speaking to these people who believed in him. The problem is they weren't truly disciples and they did not know the truth and the truth had not set them free. What does he say in verse 34? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. You still commit sin? You're a slave of sin. You still make sin? Uh, you're a slave of sin. Well, you aren't free. You're still a slave of it. Well, the problem is, as you keep reading in verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever, but only the one who's been set free. Now, in Romans chapter 6, going back to Romans, but backing up a chapter, we'd already talked about all this, about sin, whether or not you've been dead to sin. If you die, do it. How can sin still be alive? Well, the whole point is whether or not sin was destroyed, whether or not you've been freed. Kyle, what does it mean again to be crucified in verse 6 and verse 7 of chapter 6? Of what? I'm sorry, which Romans. Book? Romans chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Go ahead and read it since you're there. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, so that our body of sin might be destroyed or done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Kyle, someone who's been crucified with Christ, they're no longer a what? They're no longer a slave. No longer a slave to sin. Uh, because in verse 7, what? For he who has died is freed from sin. If you've died, you're freed from sin. And only the person who has died in verse 8 will do what? Now, if we had died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So if you haven't died to sin, if sin has not been destroyed, if you have not been set free from sin, i.e. died to sin, then you won't live with Christ. Uh, this person, Kyle, in Romans chapter 7 that we're covering, this old man that I'm charging him as, has not died, but is still a slave of sin. Kyle, 
He says that you're no longer to be a slave of sin if you've died. That's right. This person in Romans chapter 7 is opposite of the man here in 6 because he hasn't been spiritually crucified. That's right. If he haven't died, then you will not live with Christ. You want to continue to identify with a Romans chapter 7 man? Not okay, me. then guess what? You won't live with Christ because you're still a slave of sin. As you keep looking in chapter 6, verse 18, you see, in verse 17, does he say that they're still a slave of sin? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. So they were a slave of sin. They are not still to be a slave of sin. That slave of sin. Yeah. That's if you became obedient from the heart. Correct. And if you did become obedient from the heart, then what happened to you in verse 18? And Again? having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Oh, freed from sin, slaves to righteousness. Uh, and then... And in that life, as you keep reading on, it talks about that uh, that life um, as a slave of righteousness and sanctification. In verse 20, what does he say again? That For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So again, when they were a slave of sin, not that they're still supposed to be a slave of sin. And in verse 22, he says, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you have your fruit in sanctification, and the outcome of that life is what? Eternal life. Eternal life. But Kyle, that's only the one who's been freed from sin. You see, the man in Romans chapter 7 is still a slave of sin. He's still a slave to sin. Right. Kyle, that man does not have eternal life. That's right. He's doomed. But everybody wants to be the doomed man because they don't know the power of God, and they're being robbed and not taught and I think the power part, of God. I think a lot of it too is just look at some how some of these Bibles will put in something like they call it here in this one the conflict of two natures. Like here's this little section from verses fourteen to twenty five is going to talk about the the conflict of two natures. No, there's there's one type of nature in you now. You're either you're either holy or you're unholy. Those are only only. Two, you're, you can't be, a good fruit can't be produced from a, a bad tree, and bad fruit can't come from a good tree. And we're going to cover more of that because now we're getting into some other words that will be introduced in here. And we're going to hammer home all these, Kyle. Kyle, can you go back now? I want to read uh, verse chapter 7, verse 15 to 16. Yes. For what am I, what am I, am, ugh. for what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. That's right. So here, when he says, for I am not practicing what I want to do, mm -hmm. that word is praiso. It's Strong's Concordance 4238. Praiso. A lot of times you'll, it'll be translated as to practice. People will try to say it's habitually practice. I'm like, nope. If you go look it up, it's it's what are you working? What are you doing? Um, and the word is used like you can look at it when Jesus talks about uh, with the disciples of who is going to uh, betray him at the Last Supper, and the disciples say, "Oh, who who is it that's going to uh, betray you? Who's going to do this thing?" And it uses that word, prezo, uh, practice. But they don't put practice because it wouldn't make sense. It's an event. It's you're doing that thing. It's to do something or to be doing something. Um, again, when when Paul, uh, as you look at it later on in Acts, at one of the cities he was at, when they were uh, a, they the people brought him out to I think the the one um, auditorium and they want they were uh, wanted to accuse Paul and I think they grabbed Jason and uh, the one leader comes out and says, "Hey men, be careful what you're going to do. We'll be accused of a riot." They weren't practicing rioting. Like, as you would think of every day of their life, it was an event. And you go through, and there's so many places that uses that word where it's like, it's just, it's in the act of doing. It's in the yeah. act of doing in the moment. And let me catch people up there. We're talking again about the Greek word in Strong's number 4238. And it's defined in the NASB as prasso, as being practicing. Uh, and some some people will teach it as a habitual thing. But again, you don't, like Sam just mentioned, you can't habitually be rioting. It's not a the the riot is an event, an act. Uh, habitually um, betraying Jesus, you know, when when Judas did the event. 
Uh, but that's fine. And, and in the Strong's Concordance, it will actually tell you that that's to be opposite with a single act of doing something, which it says is poia, yeah. which is 4160 Strong's Concordance. And it's going to be very interesting because this word that they say is to commit a single act of sin is the one that's used in John, 1 John chapter 3. Uh, so we're going to have fun with this, Kyle. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So you have two words, 4238 and 41. Praiso, which is I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing, which is poio, the very thing I hate. And that's 4160. But if I'm doing the very thing I don't want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. Now, what's interesting is then when you go and you look at Romans chapter 7, verse 19, where he says, the good I want to do, I do not do but I practice the very evil I do not want, there, again, the practice is 4238, where he's practicing the evil, whereas, again, in verse 15, where he says, I'm doing the evil, or the thing I hate, he uses poio. So he uses both words of the man who's doing the thing that he hates, or doing the evil. So it doesn't matter. I, t- yeah. I tell people, if you want to try to split hairs over whether, words... Whether you practice... Or you do, or you continually do it. Sin is sin, and he uses both words to say the person's doing the thing that he hates. He uses both, so you're 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 in a bind. Either way, you're doing it. That's right. Now, what gets interesting is, well, let's go then look at what are these people who are doing the evil they don't want to do, starting with Prezo. So, what are the other places in the Bible where it talks about the one? who is doing evil. Kyle, we have this exact phrase used, the one who is doing evil or practicing the evil that uses the word prezo, the exact phrase is used in John chapter 3. Well, Kyle, that's that that makes it easy. Let's go see in John chapter 3, who is this one who is doing evil and what does God or Jesus in this point specifically say about the person that's Prezo, uh, again, 4238, this evil. John chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So that his deeds will not be reproved. And that's, that's actually the word. But here in verse 20, it says, everyone who is doing evil or praiso evil, the same phrase that's used in the word in Romans chapter 7, mm-hmm. uh, verse 19, Kyle, it says that this person hates the light. That's right. This person hates the light, does not come to the light, and he says that they, they love darkness. Why do they love darkness? Because their deeds or their work is evil, and they do evil. Kyle, this is the man of Romans chapter 7, verse 19, and verse 15 and 16. This is the man who praises evil. Why do you want to be this man? Jesus in his own man says the man who praises or practices evil is the man who does that hates the light. They hate the light. They do not come to the light. But Kyle, this is the person in Romans chapter 7, the old man, the condemned man, the wretched man, that's a slave of sin. So you who are listening, do you still want to identify with the wretched man? Uh, The man who continues to practice evil, the man who Jesus says hates the light and cannot come into the light? Why do you want to be that man? You do not want to be that man. The reason why you struggle in your life if you're that man is because you're being lied to. Your faith is not in the true power of God. That is why. The praiso you want is in verse 21. But he who praiso practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought to in God. Well, and now, Kyle, for that one, uh, that was you're reading John chapter 3, verse 21. So, yes, and that is pre, uh, poyo. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's poyo. But poyo. you know why it gets confusing? Because you just read in Strong's Concordance that they always put uh, prezo as practice and poyo yeah. as to single act. But yet here, they, they got it backwards, Kyle. Oh, my. It, like I said, it, it's a jumbled oh mess. Kyle, it is a jumbled mess. But it doesn't matter because they use both words and it's consistent. That's right. And you can look up the phrases. 
like I said, the people who do the translations are terrible, but that's fine. We're going to straighten everything out and we're going to expose all the lies today. Uh, John chapter five, flipping over to verse 29. Now, Kyle, again, this one here in 529, we're going to look at those who praise evil. Right. Remember the same one that we just covered in John chapter three, verse 20. That's the person that hates the light. Uh, the same person that we covered in Romans chapter 7, verse 19, that praise those evil. Uh, well, Kyle, what does Jesus say he's going to do to those who commit or praise o evil in John chapter 5, verse 29? I'm going to read 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. You still praise, O evil? Okay. God says you're going to be resurrected to a resurrection of judgment. Do you see how repeatedly, repeatedly, when we go and we look up these words and these phrases, it's the man under condemnation. You will not find it as the new man. As a matter of fact, this struggle of Romans chapter 7 only exists in one place, and it's for the condemned man. It's the condemned man, the man who has not been freed, the man who has not been spiritually baptized, the man who's still a slave of sin, the man who cannot do any good, the man who does not understand, the man who is wretched, the man who is condemned, still in chains, still a prisoner of sin. Why on earth would you ever want to be that man? Because you're being lied to by the devil and the devil's workers. That's why. You're being deceived by people who are deceiving others and they're deceived themselves and they don't even know it as discussed in the warnings in 2 Peter chapter 3 or 2 Timothy chapter 3. In Romans chapter 2, verse 2, those who praise O, who practice, back to Romans, the Romans. We, we were in Romans earlier. Verse 2. Uh, so chapter 2, verse, verse two. 2, that word again is praise O. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice or do such things. That practice, praiso, you're praising such things. Well, what such things are he's talking about? Well, when you back up, he talks about uh, unrighteousness. This is chapter 1, verse 29 and 30. Wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slander. Uh, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient, um, un without understanding, oh, without understanding, yeah. untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Remember, unloving works no evil, but this person works evil. Uh, they don't love their neighbor as himself. That's right. uh, they hate God. Oh, but I don't hate God. Remember, if you do evil, you hate the light. Uh, so, you know, oh, but 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 I love God. Um, you don't keep the commandments. You're a liar. The truth is not in you. Y you see, it's not what you say. It's what God says. So you're still the person that prays those. Oh, well, the judgment of God still falls upon you. Okay. You haven't escaped it because you're still the condemned man. And we did a whole episode on chapter two. Romans chapter 2. Yep. So all these, you can go back and you can look at all these chapters and we go through the full context. And guess what? Spoiler alert, the message does not change. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Others who are praising uh, evil works. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or good. Or bad. Yep, praiso, according to what he has praisoed, his or practiced or done. Again, you want to praise you be the person that does the bad things? Okay, well, you're gonna be judged by Christ. Uh, another use of the word in Galatians chapter five, verse nineteen. Now we'll read that and then we'll go back and cover more of it. Um I'm sorry, chapter five, verse twenty twenty one. Uh, 20 and 21, or which? Well, just read 21, then I'm going to go back. All right. Envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So those who praise those such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what he was talking about is that he was contrasting those who are of the flesh or those who are of the spirit. In verse 19, he says, the deeds of the flesh are evident. Well, what are deeds of the flesh? Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, 
dispute, dissension, faction, envy, drunkenness, any of these things, which Paul told them before, and he warned them again. If you praise o these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But Kyle, the man of Romans chapter 7, that's all he does. All he does is praise o evil. The same word, same tense, same present tense, and these are the same tenses too, by the way. Kyle, that man will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's right. It's very clear. We've covered earlier, that man will be judged. That man will be resurrected to, to, to not judgment. to life, but to judgment. That's right. And you want to be that man? How many passages do we want? Do we need to cover to show you that you don't want to be that man? Okay, Kyle, let's go to... Now, I want to just, for the sake of the audience, I don't want to be that man, so... <laughs> yeah, okay. And I certainly, right now, know that I am not that man. Thank so God. that's the prezo. Yes. Now, let's see if it's any different with poyo, which is also to do or to make. Uh, which we read about, which again showed up in Romans chapter 15 and 16. Uh, where was it? It's where he says, I am doing the thing that I hate. I'm doing the thing I don't want to do. Uh, the good that I want to do, I'm not doing. Okay, so that's that word, that doing, doing, doing. Uh, how, or your, your Bible, it might say commit, it might say practice. That's Poyo. Yes, Romans 7, verse 15. Yes. Uh, um, and that's Strong's Concordance, 4160. It's in the present tense of the verb. So now let's go look at the present tense of that verb and other places, and let's see the person who is making or doing these things, what's the promise? Because this person says he cannot poyo good. He only poyos bad. So let's look at the Bible and says, well, what happens to a person if they cannot poyo good? Uh, so Kyle, let's start and let's go back to Matthew Jesus's words, chapter three, verse eight through verse 10. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The ax is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. The bear is poyo, to make or to do. You cannot make or do the good fruit? Well, then you cannot keep with repentance. You cannot bear or make the good fruit? The axe is already laid and is going to cut you down and you're going to be thrown into the fire. That's what Jesus said. Kyle, the man in Romans chapter 7... Dude. Uh, he cannot make any good. All he does is make evil. Kyle, he hasn't, even, laid. he hasn't even come into the repentance of God. Nope. Just like the person who, who godly sorrow versus, you know, sorrow of the world that only works death. This person's, there's, they're already a dead tree. There's nothing live in them. They're deceived. Matthew chapter 7. We covered this earlier with uh, um, the Ergonazami. Uh, but now we're going to go back and look at how where Poyo shows up because it shows a lot up before. And notice they're all together, Kyle. They're all together. Yeah. This is again that that man, the Romans seven man. So in Romans chapter seven, verse Matthew seven. seven. Uh, yeah, Matthew. Matthew chapter seven, uh, verse seventeen to twenty-one. So every good tree bears good fruit. Poyo. But the bad tree bears bad fruit. Poyo. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. That's right. Boyo, both of those. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. And 21. 20. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And that's also Poyo. So, you can't bear good fruit. You're only bearing bad fruit. You're going to be cut down and thrown into the fire, just what we read in Matthew chapter 3. Jesus said, they're going to know you by your fruits. Only the one who is doing, poyo, the will of God, who is in heaven, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But Kyle, the man of Romans chapter 7 cannot do good. The man of Romans chapter 7 cannot do the will of God. All he does is the will of sin. He's a slave of sin. Do you see how that man is condemned? Absolutely. Like doubly condemned, like all over the place Everywhere. condemned. Yep. And, and people want to be this man. It's I, I plead, I beg, I say, oh, no, 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 you do not want to be this man. You definitely do not want to be this man. 
Matthew chapter 12, verse 50, referring to who would Jesus say is his brother, sister, and mother. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Again, that's the poyo. Are you doing the will of God? If you cannot do the will of God, then you can't. Other places um, that it also shows up, Matthew chapter 13, when it talks about the seed, right? And there's only one seed that it fell on the good soil, and that's the man who hears the word and understands it. Oh, this man has understanding, Matthew chapter 13, verse 23. Yeah, the guy in Romans 7 had no understanding. He had none, but this man has understanding, who indeed bears fruit, poyo, brings forth a hundred sixty and thirtyfold. Well, that's the man who has the good heart. That's the man who's going to be blessed. But again, who are those that are going to be cast into the furnace of fire in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41 and 42? 41 and 42. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those who commit lawlessness, that's poyo. Those who break the law, those who are doing evil, they're going to be thrown into the furnace of fire and of that place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Matthew chapter 21, verse 43, Jesus says, who's going to receive the kingdom of heaven? Who is he, who he's going to give it to? Chapter and verse again. Chapter 21, verse 43, those who are poyo or doing something. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. That's right. If anybody thought they had the kingdom of God, that man of Romans chapter 7, well, not anymore. It will be taken away from that person because they only do the bad. They cannot do the good. And Luke chapter 8 or chapter 3 verse 8 and 9, again, the same thing about bearing fruit and being the trees cutting down. Uh, in Luke chapter 6, verse 43 to 46, if you want to read that. 6, 43 to 46? Mm -hmm. Okay. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit. That's poyo. Nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. Poyo again. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good, and the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. And verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Hoyo again. You see, Kyle, the man of Romans chapter 7, the condemned man, the wretched man, he cannot do what Jesus says. All he does is evil. He cannot do the good that Jesus commands him to do. That's right. Uh, he cannot poyo those things, Kyle. Again, he cannot bear the good fruit. All he does is continue to bear the bad fruit. But yet people think this person's blessed. The problem is the heart, Kyle. It's the man with a good heart that's able to produce the good things. That's right. This And, and again, he got you, don't, a new heart. you don't produce both. So I, I, I pray people are being convicted here like, oh my goodness, I definitely don't want to be the man of Romans chapter 7. That man is condemned. And Luke chapter 10. Poyo. What are the things that we must poyo to inherit eternal life? In Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 28. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Hoyo again. Those are the things we're to be doing. You're doing those, you'll live. You're doing those, you'll inherit, the, you'll inherit eternal life. It's about You're the doing deeds. those, you're keeping the law. You're loving your neighbor as yourself. And we covered all these and all the other episodes that we did when we looked at Love, the Greatest Commandment. And and again, earlier, with, with all the series in this this current series, starting in part one. 
Uh, John chapter 3, verse 21, we already covered it earlier with, with the other Aragon. But again, he who practices the truth comes to the light, so his deeds may be manifested to having been worked in God. That practices the truth, again, that's poyo. Uh, but again, the, this other man who's condemned cannot do it. Uh, some other passages in, we already covered John chapter 5, 29. Again, those who do good deeds... They go to a resurrection of life. That word is poyo. And then those who do evil, that's the prezo, uh, to a resurrection of judgment. So again, you find these words everywhere. Um, it's just so consistent. John chapter 8, verse 34. Remember we covered that recently about mm-hmm. the one who is committing sin as a slave of sin? Yep. The slave does not get to remain in the house forever. That's right. Uh, let's, let's go back and look at that one again, because I want to point out some other things. All right. Jesus answered them. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So again, the commit is the poyo. They continue to do the sin, the evil. That's the same that this man in Romans chapter 7 is doing. Now, Jesus, speaking to those people who had believed in him, right, from verse 30 and 31, um, he continues to talk to them because they didn't understand. So he tells them what work they're doing. And John chapter 8 Verse 38, what, do, what does he say? I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. Ah, uh, the do, again, the poyo, they're doing the things. Mm-hmm. Not the good, but the evil. Right. And and who do you think their father is? Oh, he says they in verse say 41. Yeah, well, they say that they made a claim to Abraham as their father, but he says this, you are doing the deeds of your father in verse 41. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Yeah, and so verse 41, again, he accuses them saying, you You are are doing doing the the deeds deeds of your father. Again, that's poyo. And then in verse 44, again, you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And again, they're doing the bad desires. Right. They can't do the good desires, the, the good that's in the man. He, he's been confronted with the law. He knows what's good, but he can't do the will of God. All he can do is the evil desires, the will of the devil. This is the condemned man. Again, the, the man that we continue to read about in Romans chapter 7. Jesus says, who are his friends in John chapter 15, verse 14, about who are those who can do or poyo. Yes, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And again, same present tense, if you're doing what I command you. Mm. But they can't. This person can't do any good. They cannot do any good. They are condemned. In Romans chapter 2, verse 3, and we've covered some of that before because appraisal was there. Mm -hmm. But again, poyo is also there. Uh, Present tense, chapter 2, verse 3. But do you suppose this, O man... When you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? There you go. You see, they're doing the same thing. Poyo. This person's not going to escape the judgment of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, which is what we're supposed to be doing in our example. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, why did Jesus bear our sins again on his body? And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So that we might be dead to sin and live to righteousness. Not doing sin, but being dead to it. Remember, this person's not dead to it. They're a slave to it. Uh, sin is not dead in their members. It's alive. Uh, the man who's wretched and condemned. But Kyle, we've been called for a purpose in verse 21, the same purpose of Christ. Yep. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. And then he gives the examples of what that is. The very first thing in verse 22 is to commit no sin. That's poyo, no sin. Do no sin. That's our example, Kyle nor any deceit found in his mouth. 
That's right, no deceit. Now, if you continue looking over in 1 Peter, uh, again, more use of the word about the do, the poyo. In 1 Peter chapter 3, um, verse 8, 9, it talks about the one who wants to inherit a blessing. He's like, Mm -hmm. you want to inherit a blessing? Well, what must you do or poyo in verse 10 and 11? For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So we already read the one about praiso evil, which is the one that the Romans chapter 7 talked about, and we talked about how that man's condemned. Now here again it says, poyo, no evil. Uh, God's face is against the man who continues to do evil. But yet in Romans chapter seven, it also says, but this person continues to poyo the stuff he doesn't want to do. That's right. The bad. And he doesn't poyo any good. But the man who's blessed in verse 11 is the one who turns away from evil and now only does good. That's right. Do you see the opposites, Kyle? Yeah, absolutely. You see the Plain as day. Absolute opposites yep. about the man who's blessed versus the man who's condemned. But everybody wants to be that man of Romans chapter 7 because that's what they identify. Because, Kyle, that's how many people are in the world that are living a lie, that are living a falsehood. There are so many people that are on that wide path. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me. I don't know you. All those who are seeking him, this is who we're talking about. You, you identify with the man of Romans chapter 7? Well, that's the man who doesn't know Christ. That's the man who's on the wide path of all the people who seek Christ, who confess him as Lord but still do evil, they're the ones on the wide path that leads to destruction. Those are the ones he was speaking about. All of you who hold to the Romans chapter 7, you're in trouble. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 10, how do you make certain about your entrance into the kingdom of heaven? Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Poyo 4160. Poyo. And what are the things that we're talking about? Well, when you back up, it's about the one who's become a partaker of the divine nature. They've escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust in verse 4. They now apply diligence in their faith, moral excellence, knowledge. Oh, knowledge. Knowledge. Uh, mastery, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. He says, Make certain about his calling and election of you. As long as you practice or poyo or do these things, you'll never stumble. And in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Well, Kyle, it's not going to be abundantly supplied to the man of Romans chapter 7 because he can't do any good. He doesn't do any good. All he does is the evil. Do you see, Kyle? I, I, I mean, it's just everywhere. Yep. It's everywhere. But people want to continue to cling to the man that's condemned. Let's go to 1 John. More poyos. This is just going to pound it home, Kyle. Yes. The people who all they do is evil and they cannot do any good. 1 John chapter 2. First he says in verse 15 to 16 that we aren't to love something. For do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And then he tells us who lives forever in verse 17. The world is passing away and also its lust. But the one who is doing the will of God lives forever. Poyo, Poyo. present tense. But that's not what the person is doing in Romans chapter 7. It's the same word, same tense, but they're doing the opposite, Kyle. They can't do the good. That's right. And continuing on, in the back end of chapter 2, and verse 28 and 29, again, the practice here is poyo to be making. What does he say? Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shriek away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who also practices righteousness is born of him. Well, there you go. You see, if you can't practice righteousness, you aren't born of God. If you can't poyo the righteous. Same present tense verb, same that's used in Romans. The problem is the man in Romans doesn't do any of that. They can't. They want to. They actually want to, but can't. If that's you, 
Well, then you're in trouble. You have to come to the truth, put your faith in the truth, and you have to run from the people who are feeding you lies and leading to you, you to their death. And they don't even know it. They're leading themselves to their own death. It's the blind leading the blind. You must come out of the blind darkness. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 through 10. Kyle here, it's all filled with poyo, 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 poyo. All the present tense, the same verb that's used. Verse 4 through 10. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. The man who's still doing lawlessness or sin, you're in trouble. Poyo. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. You see, Kyle, the man in Romans chapter 7, all he does is evil. The sin still dwells in him. The sin is still alive and operating. His members are a slave of sin. That's all he produces. Kyle, this says that that man doesn't abide in Christ, doesn't know him. That's right. That's because that man doesn't know Christ. He has not been spiritually baptized. He has no understanding. He has not received power. The Spirit of God does not dwell in him. Sin dwells in him. He's still of flesh and a slave of sin. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. Please, you who are listening, are you listening to that? Do not let anyone deceive you. God is commanding you to let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Now, I I actually like the NIV translation the best on this. It has the best and correct rendering. It's if you continue in sin, you cannot continue in sin. And the word is poyo. It's not prezo. It's poyo. It shouldn't be saying practice. It's just to commit. It should say commit. King James uses commit. That's a good word. Uh, I like the NIV. NAS, there's where I give them a big negative strike. They, they did a terrible job on this, and they deceive people. But again, highlights. You cannot abide in Christ if you still sin. No one who sins has seen him or known him. Stop being deceived. No, the one who practices or does righteousness is righteous just as Christ is righteous. But yet the man of Romans chapter 7, all he does is the same word. All he's practicing or poyoing is evil, the things that he hate. The problem is the one who's poyoing sin, which is what the man of Romans chapter 7 does, is of the devil. Right here, is of the devil. That's right. That man is of the devil. The devil sinned from the beginning, but the son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil, not to continue to ergon the works of the devil but to have them put to death, to be removed. No one who has been born of God practices or poyos sin. But that's what Romans chapter 7 man does, poyo, poyo, poyo. Because his seed abides in him, he cannot sin because he's been born of God. And again, how do we know who the children of God are? The ones who poyo righteousness. But again, a man of Romans chapter 7 cannot poyo righteousness. He poyos the evil and the things that he hates. Why would you ever want to be that man? And 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, uh, who's, there's one who uh, is pleasing to God, the one who poyos what? And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Yep, poyo, but not the man of Romans chapter 7. Oh, God's not going to answer his prayer, and he's not pleasing in, in the sight of God. 1 John chapter 5, uh, verse 2 and 3. 2 and 3. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and observe his commandments. Poyo, his commandments. Doing Doing. his commandments. Well, that's not the man of Romans chapter 7. And and are the the commandments of God difficult, Kyle? No, they're not not, not burdensome at all. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Well, Kyle, they must be burdensome for the man of Romans chapter 7, because he wants to do them, and he can't even do them. He can't do any! He lacks the spirit, he lacks the power. That's exactly right, Kyle. Uh, Let's see. Oh, Revelation chapter 11. We find that Romans chapter 11 man again here. Uh, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. 22, 11. 
and 12. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. But Kyle, the, that man of Romans cannot practice righteousness. It's poyo. He cannot do any good. All he does is evil. This man is still the one who still does the filthy, who still does the wrong. Kyle, that one's, that one's in trouble because that's the man who's going to be condemned. Yeah. Do you see, Kyle? It's just everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Now, a couple things with evil. Because again, in evil, when you go back and you look at Romans chapter 7, there was a lot of evil that we found in Romans chapter 7, right? When you looked at the verse. And the word is 2556. It's an adjective, Strong's 2556. And just for everybody out there, uh, chapter and verse again. So in Romans chapter 7... Uh, what we'll find is that this person continues to do evil. What does he say in verse 29? 29. You said Romans 7, but there is no 29. Yeah. I'm sorry, 19. Chapter 7, verse 19. Okay. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. All this one does is the evil. And again, in verse 21, it says, I find then the law. That when I desire to do good, evil is present with me. He can't escape the evil. Now, a couple things about this. When you look at this evil, again, I did a search on it, looked at a couple places. We've covered some of them. There's so much overlap here. I'm just going to run through and highlight these because I want to get to some other things about the dwelling. Uh, but for evil. And Mark chapter 7, verse 21, it says, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries. And he goes on to say is, these are the things that defile a man. Uh, and Jesus taught that. It's the evil that's within our heart. Well, that's all this person does. They can't get away from the evil because they haven't received the new heart. You don't want to be that person. We covered much of that in the new heart episodes. Go listen to those and you'll find more. And Romans chapter 2, verse 9, we, we covered this at the very beginning, that the one who still does evil, there's going to be tribulation and distress for the soul of that man. But yet this person, Romans chapter 7, cannot escape evil. Later on in Romans chapter 12, verse 21, uh, the command is given to do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Again, this person cannot overcome evil, uh, overcome evil with good. They can't even do good. All they do is evil. Romans chapter 13, verse 10, just highlighting it again. Remember, love works no evil. But yet this person, that's all they do. They can't escape it. In Romans chapter 16, verse 19, it says, for, for the report of your obedience has reached all, because he's referring to those who do have obedience, those of a true faith. Therefore, I'm rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and pure in what is evil. Not the man of Romans chapter 7, he can't escape it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, now, these things happen as examples to us. This is the example where Israel's destroyed in the wilderness because they continue to do evil. They couldn't escape it. He says, this is for our example so that we would not desire evil as they did. And they were destroyed because they couldn't escape sin. And yet the, Romans, the man of Romans 13 cannot escape the evil. He's condemned. He's destroyed. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, the love, love is, right? Love does not envy. It does not boast. It uh, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thanks no evil. It thanks no evil. And again, Jesus taught that. If you have thoughts of evil, you're still defiled. You're defiled in your heart. Now, many versions don't get it right. They say, it keeps no record of wrong. You actually go do a study of that. It's no. It's, it's thanks no evil. King James Version got that one right. And it's consistent with Jesus' teaching. But the Romans, man, forget thank no evil. He can't stop doing evil. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 33, uh, Kyle, on this one, I found something new. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, uh, I actually uh, learned more on this one. It says, stopped being deceived. Now, I used to say bad company, uh, company corrupts good morals. It's actually evil speech, evil conversations corrupts or destroys good morals. Catch that? 
But again, this person, they have in Romans chapter 13, they're beyond evil speech. They just have evil deeds. They can't escape it. But again, evil speech, um, it's not company. I actually looked up that word. It's It Homilier. comes from... That's right. It comes from like a homily. It's the speech. Now, this is the noun. If you go to the verb, it's talk, speak, conversation. The noun is the conversation, the speech. Evil speech destroys good morals. Stop being deceived. And then he goes on to say, awake to righteousness and stop sinning. For some of you have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Well, this is the words for the man of Romans chapter 7. They have no knowledge of God. They don't have understanding. They cannot stop sinning. They're in trouble. They haven't awoken to righteousness. They're still in darkness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, when Paul commands them to test themselves to see if they're even in the faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7. He says, now we pray to God that you do no, no evil. Yep. And the do is poyo. You're not to be doing any evil. Not that we ourselves might uh, appear approved, but that you might do what is right, even though we may appear disqualified. And he was chastising them. But again, the Romans chapter 7, man, that's all he does. All he does is evil because he's disqualified. And in um, other evil, Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, what does he warn them of? Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. Yep. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. That's right. You're still an evil worker like these in, for, in, in, uh, in the Romans chapter 7. Now God warns us about them. You see, they're false. They're false. It's right here. He's talking about the Jews. But today it's all these false Christians. They're still evil doers. They cannot stop doing evil. James chapter 3, verse 8. What does it say about the tongue? James chapter 3, verse 8. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. That's right. But then it goes on to talk about the perfect man who can tame the tongue and bridle the entire body. Uh, they have the wisdom from above, not as you keep reading, the person who has the wisdom that's demonic. Yep. Uh, again, th this contrasts with that man of Romans Chapter 7. Uh, when you look at um, 1 Peter chapter 3, just highlighting again, right when we covered verse 8 through uh, 13 about evil, um, keep your tongue from evil, uh, turn from evil, uh, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You can't be doing evil. And we cover those. I'm just hiding it again to yep. remind people evil is bad. And in 3 John chapter 1 verse 11, what does God say about uh, evil? 3 John Verse 11. Verse 11. There's only one chapter. Yep. <laughs> Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. You still do evil. You haven't seen God. But the man in Romans chapter 7, they haven't. You don't want to be that man. That man does not and has not seen God. Okay, Kyle. Now let's go back to Romans chapter 7 again. And let's look at the dwell. Remember in chapter 7, verse 17 to 18, what is it that's dwelling in this person? So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Oh, sin is dwelling in him because it hasn't been put to death or removed. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Nothing good dwells in him. That is in my flesh for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Cannot do good, even though he wants to. And in verse 20, But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Sin which sin dwells, dwells in this in man. Him. Now, Kyle, dwelling, to dwell. What is supposed to be dwelling in us? Here's Kyle, God. God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 and 18 through his word, he says, what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? We are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them. I will dwell in them. Same, same word. And walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you. And I'll be a father and you shall be sons and daughters to me. God is to dwell in us, but we're to be separate. Were to be clean, not like this man of Romans chapter 7, who's all dirty. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, uh, what else is to be dwelling in us? Colossians 3, verse 16 to 17. 
Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Yep, that doesn't sound like the uh, the Romans, man. In 2 uh, Timothy uh, verse one, chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure that has been entrusted to you. Again, Paul referring to those by which the Holy Spirit does dwell. Now, because we're in Romans, Romans, this man in chapter 7 doesn't have the Spirit. Chapter 8 tells him how to get the Spirit, and he contrasts. Chapter 8 also tells him, because some people cannot please God, what does he say in Romans chapter 8, verse 8 and 9? And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Oh, that sounds like the Romans chapter 7, man. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Oh, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Again, this is all a teaching moment. You see, because the Romans chapter 17 man cannot please God, does not do any good, only does evil, doesn't understand, is a slave of sin, sin hasn't been put to death, sin continues to dwell and live, but what happened to the Spirit? Oh, the Spirit must not be dwelling in him. Well, he repeats it. In case you miss verse 9, the conditional if, he goes on to say in verse 12, So then, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh. We are not to live according to the flesh. Verse 13, if you're living according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the Spirit, or you're putting to death the deeds of the flesh, the body, and you will live. You see, again, the Spirit is to be dwelling in us. What does he say in verse 11? But... If the Spirit of God of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Well, that's assuming that the Spirit dwells in them. But again, this man doesn't seem to say that any good dwells within him. Well, how can the Spirit of God dwell with? Because it doesn't. The Spirit of God is not dwelling in that man of Romans chapter seven. These are all bookends, Kyle. It, yep. It's it's sandwiched in the middle. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I just want to add one more there, Romans 8, 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Uh, Those people are still slaves, though. The Romans chapter 7 men. That's right. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Do you not know? Now, again, the the Corinthians were struggling... um, you can listen to that episode, and you'll realize a lot of them were still fleshly. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Now, what about the inner man? In Romans chapter 7, verse 22, he says he joyfully concurs with the law of God in the inner man. The problem, Kyle, is he has a head knowledge, but what happened to the power? You see, mm-hmm. somebody who has the Spirit of God that's dwelling in the inner man, what does God say about that person when we read his word in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16? that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man. Oh, Kyle, that means God's power and Spirit is supposed to be inside of us in the that's inner right. man. That's and right. when you continue... To conti- overcome. And when you to keep... To endure. That's right. To persevere. That's right. And there when, is no other way. And when you keep reading the book of Ephesians, going into chapter 4, chapter 5... It talks about the man who's become the perfect man, the same fullness of Christ, that we're no longer to walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, darkened their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because they have not laid aside the old manner of life. They still walk in sin. The wrath of God still comes upon them because they're those who are still sons of disobedience. But that's not not the person we're supposed to be. That's right. We did an episode on the book of Ephesians chapter 2 through 5. We covered all that. Again, that's not the man of Romans chapter 7, the condemned man, the man who has no power. The Spirit does not dwell in them. They're still a slave of sin. And what wages war in their body in verse 23? Of of chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verse 23. What is waging war in their body? You're there. Go ahead. I was still back in Ephesians. I see a different law in my members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members, O wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death, through verse 24. So I'm going to look at a couple things here, Kyle. I want to look quickly at waging war, uh, what the Bible says about being a prisoner, what the Bible says about being the law of sin, and then the wretched man. And then I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. I know this is going long, but there's so much to cover. Uh, I wanted to cover all these things. 
So waging war. Kyle, waging war. What does it say about the war that's being waged in the man of James chapter 4, verse 1? James chapter 4, verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? Oh, see, this person, they have conflicts within them. Oh, almost sounds like the conflict that this person of Romans uh, has. That's right. But there's a war going on in their members. So he goes on, you lust, you do not have, you commit murder. You're envious, cannot obtain, so you fight your quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Kyle, what does God call the man here who has warring going on in their members in verse 4? Adulteresses. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You see, Kyle, this person of Romans chapter 13, they're an adulteress. Yep. Uh, we're going to find out more when we go back to Romans chapter 7. He just calls them and warns them about being the adulteress mm-hmm. in the earlier the chapter, which we're going to hit on here. But he tells them because they, they're they warring in their members. They can't overcome. He tells them what they need. What does he say the actual solution is? That the person doesn't acknowledge. They just says they have nothing good that dwells within them. But what's supposed to be dwell, in them, dwell within them in verse 5? Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Oh, but remember, Kyle, this person has nothing good that dwells within them because they're the wretched man. Uh, The other passage here, again, warring. We aren't supposed to be warring. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Yep, that's right. It wages war against the soul. But again, the man of Romans chapter 7 is trapped. Uh, when we look at prisoners, right? Uh, prisoner. Because he says, oh, I'm a, I'm a prisoner of the law of sin within me. Mm-hmm. When, when you look at the prisoner in Colossians chapter 2.11, uh, we are not to be a prisoner. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Yep, the removal of the body of the flesh. Now, what's ironic here is this person is a slave to the body of the flesh, or the body of the sin of the flesh, as the King James Version has it, because they haven't been spiritually crucified or baptized. They're still a prisoner of sin. And Romans chapter 6, already speaking about what this means, that we're not to be this slave, that we're to be set free. And Romans chapter 6, we already covered in verse 6 that we're to be, sin is to be done away with, that we're no longer to be a slave, right? Uh, that if we've died, then we're freed from sin. That was verse 7. Mm-hmm. Um, that if we've died in verse 8 with Christ, then we'll live with him. Now, speaking to the life that Jesus lives in verse 11 through 13, does it, what does it say about sin in our bodies and whether or not it, our members are to be slaves of sin? Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. But Kyle, all these people do is his members are a slave to sin. He's a prisoner of the sin in his members. That's not this man. That's not this man. Therefore, sin is no longer to reign in your mortal body. That's not this man. Do not present the members of your body to sin. Oh no, not to instruments of righteousness. You're to be alive. Present yourself to God as alive from the dead. Well, that's assuming that you were crucified and rose again and alive. Walking in the newness of life, spiritual baptism discussed in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We covered so much of this in the part two episode of Overcoming sin, spiritually crucified and baptized. If you have not listened to it, you need to go listen to it. Now, again, the person who's been crucified, Kyle, is sin still their master in verse 14? For sin shall not be a master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Kyle, the the Romans chapter 6, 7 man is still under the law. Sin is still their master. That's right. Kyle, when you continue to do sin, what's the result of that person's life in verse 16? Do you not know 
that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, resulting in death, or of obedience, resulting in righteousness. Remember, this person has death. Sin still works death in them. Remember that yep. we read? Uh, but when you're freed from sin and you become slaves of righteousness, right? Verse 18, that's what it says. We aren't mm-hmm. to be slaves of sin. What happens in the members of your body in verse 19? I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness. That's past tense. Yep. Resulting in further lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. And that's the new man. But yet the man of Romans chapter 7, they cannot obey. They're still a slave of sin. They produce death. They haven't been freed. Uh, Their members are a slave of sin, not a slave of righteousness. Their members are a slave of unrighteousness. They cannot stop. Do you see the opposites? Yep. Do you see all the contrast? Again, sin. We said sin shall not be master over you. Verse 14. This person in chapter 7, verse 23, says they're a prisoner of the law of sin. Sin's not supposed to be your master. How are you a prisoner of the law of sin? Because you were never spiritually crucified and baptized? You know, in in Romans chapter 7, verse uh, 1 and 2, what does it say? Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the person who hasn't been spiritually put to death. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law according uh, concerning the husband. That's right. Now, if while the husband is living, in verse 3, she's joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she's free from the law. Catch that, Kyle? Yep. Free from the law so that she's not an adulteress, though she be joined to another man, because you have to be spiritually crucified with Christ. Verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. That's right. In order that we might bear fruit for God, because until that happens, you cannot. For what in verse five, for while we are in the flesh, oh, here's that man of Romans chapter seven, the sinful desires by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. That's the person who's the past, who hasn't been freed. But now, we have been released from the law in verse 6, having died to that by which we were bound, so we serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of letter. Kyle, do you see how that's just all opposites? Yep. And yet the man of Romans chapter 7, oh no, sin dwells in his body. His members are a prisoner of sin. All he does is bear death in his members. And that's why he claims in verse 24 of chapter 7, what? Wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from the body of this death? Kyle, there's only one other place in the Bible that I mentioned that uses the word wretched man. The same word, the same Greek word. Romans, cha- Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, the church of Laodicea. What was the problem with Laodicea in verse 15 as we read through verse 17? I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because of you, you are lukewarm. And neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And so he goes on, says that they have to buy gold refined by fire uh, so that they might become rich, white garments so they might be clothed, uh, and clothe their shame with their nakedness, eye salve so that they might see because they're blind. He tells them that they must repent. And Kyle, this is what people don't understand. They want to be the wretched man. So in the end, how is there no condemnation? Chapter 8, verse 1, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. But the man of Romans chapter 7, does he walk according to the flesh or the Spirit? No, he does not. He walks according to the flesh. That's right. He doesn't even identify with the Spirit. He says, there's nothing good that dwells in me. That's right. He's a slave of sin. All he does is produce sin, serve sin. He, as he says, my, my, with my flesh, I am a slave of the law of sin, the last uh, phrase in verse 25 of chapter 7. So here he says, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and of death. But Kyle, this person wasn't set free from the law of sin and of death. Yep. They're still a slave. 
Verse 3, for what the law could not do, weak as it was in the flesh, God did, sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. For sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So that the requirement of the law is now fulfilled in who, in verse 4? In us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And see, Kyle, there's, there you have it. But until you've been spiritually crucified and baptized, you can know the right thing. You can want to do the right thing. Kyle, I want to do the right thing. I lived the life of Romans chapter 7, that man, for decades. For decades, Kyle, I lived the life of that man. That is the man I identified with, and I thought I had hope. Praise God, he shined light on me and set me free. Amen. Father, I pray that all those that are listening, they will see that if they're holding true and identifying with the man of Romans chapter 7, they're in trouble. If people are telling them that is a normal Christian life and a struggle, they are of the devil. They speak of the devil and the lies. And they have no part in the kingdom of heaven. They have no spirit. They have no understanding. They're a slave of sin. They're of flesh and not of spirit. They have no spirit in them. They cannot do any good, even though they want to. All they do is evil and the bad. They prove that sin still dwells within them because it hasn't been put to death and removed. Whenever they want to do good, all they do is evil. Sin is a prisoner, holds them a prisoner and their members. Their members are a slave of sin. They're a wretched man. They're a slave and stuck in a body of death. Oh, Father, I pray that if people are there, that they will wake up now, that your spirit will remove the veil and let them see that they are in desperate trouble. I pray that they will come to the truth, that they acknowledge they are still an enemy of God and they have not found the grace of God yet. Father, convict them now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We hope this weekly program helped rekindle your zeal to know, love, and serve Christ day by day. If you enjoyed the program, consider subscribing and sharing with your friends. Thanks for listening.